data models and how to what we need and what some of the issues are um, if we want to start developing open source software for transit. And um, what we've heard in the previous sessions today was data, data, data. If you don't have the data, you can't develop the applications. Um, what we've heard in some cases was that the organization of the data is important, the interfaces of the data is important. And what you're going to hear in this session is that the semantics, the meaning, the concept, concepts of the data are key. And uh, in the previous session, we heard about the uh, dynamic timetable generator. And I was a project manager on that. It was a uh, transportation research board uh, project. And what we found was that we used data from three different sources, different back-end data models. And the amount of effort that it took to migrate that data so that it was in a common format, a common interface format, to go into the dynamic timetable generator took an inordinate amount of effort, um, far beyond what it took to develop the application or to put up the application. Um, what we're trying to do with open source software is to lower the barriers for transit agencies to deploy technologies and applications that will help them build their business and improve their service to their customers and, and to meet their uh, requirements and their business goals and objectives. And so, um, and what we're starting with respect to the dynamic timetable generator, we had a very interesting uh, problem where we used the same backend database with two different transit agencies and because the data wasn't semantic even though we had a data model, um, we had garbage come out. And the example is that there's a, something called a pattern in transit, which is a directed path of that the service information is laid on top of the trips are laid on top of. Well, one of the transit agencies um, assumed it was directed origin to destination. The other one didn't care if it was directed origin to destination. And so when you put it into the interface, it didn't know what the origin and destination was, and so it actually went backwards. And so all the time points went backwards as well. So you can see that this is a major barrier to open source, because what you want to have with open source is you want to make sure that the data, the data concepts are the same. You want to make sure that there's a logical consistency that is very clearly defined, that you have validity checks that work across different data sets, different agencies, different data sources within an agency. Um, and you want to be able to plug in an application, dump a word file on Tomcat and have it run. And it's, it's not going to do that unless you have a data model. So what we have in this um, session is we're, we're going to do a survey of what's out there in the industry and some case studies of, of um, um, comparisons of, of different data models and some case study of what one region is uh, working on in order to define a common data model or reference model in order to uh, have plug and play type of applications. Uh, one other thing that a data model does, uh, because transit data is complex, and you have the scalability issue where you have a transit agency with two routes versus a transit agency with 700 routes, 500 routes, in, actually within the same city. Um, you have a, a major issues with, with scalability. Um, you have different levels of IT skills at transit agencies. Um, in some cases, you have very deep experience, and in some cases, you have somebody who's in planning who had a little bit of experience with Access or Excel, and that's what they use to develop their schedules, um, and that's what they use to store their data. And so what we want to do with a data model, what 
have is you have a migration path to best practices of how you define your data and what is semantically um, 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 efficient for agencies to implement. Um, so let me just step back a second and uh, define some terms. Data model is a representation of how data is organized within a business. Um, you have uh, entity relationship diagrams or object class models that you can uh, define. And there are others as well, but those are the two big ones these days. A standard is a quality or measure by which is established by which is established by authority, custom, or general consent. So, but that assumes that the measurement is <coughs> well defined, and so that's the key. We want we want to limit the ambiguity, limit the choice, constrain the choices, or if you want to extend information, that it's done in a very controlled way. Okay, so. Um, there are three English language transit data standards that I'm going to talk about. One is TransModel, and there's a um, implementation of it called TransExchange. This is uh, being developed, or has been developed by the European Union. Um, one thing that you should know about, uh, well, TransModel actually is a mistake. TransExchange is UK, TransModel is European Union. Um, if there is a European Union standard, then public agencies must implement that standard. So in Europe, any EU country that develops a public transport system must use Transmart as the back end of that standard. So it establishes a framework and a common semantic uh, definition across all of Europe, which, of course, in the US, we don't have anything like that. But in, in the US, we have something called Transient Interface Communications Profile, and that's a messaging standard that defines how, what kind of uh, messages are exchanged and what their syntax and format is. It, what it doesn't, what it lacks is the semantic uh, interoperability, the logical consistency, and the um, the data concept, the robust data concept definitions. And then there's something called geospatial one-stop. Um, part 7D uh, refers to the transit part. It's part of a larger effort that um, is, developed, is in the process of being developed uh, or promulgated as a standard by the uh, part of the e-government effort, um, um, shepherded by the USGS, and the transit portion, which is part seven, is being uh, shepherded by the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, and I forget what they're called now, GITA, and I don't know what that means, so. Should that be T-I-C-P then? Oh, T-C-I-P, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, common. Yeah, I, transit yeah. communications interface. Okay, problem. thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so trans, <laughs> Transmodel, um, it's an EU standard. It took them over 10 years to develop this. Um, they went through many different uh, versions before they got to where they are right now. It's an abstract data model. They actually didn't really know what to do with it after they had developed it because hmm. they had five implementations across Europe and none of them were the same. Hmm. Um, but it was a framework and it pr provided them with a very strong uh, conceptual model of the data for transit and the relationships among the data. Um, and it became the, the uh, foundation for developing a whole array of standards. And right now they're in the process of migrating it out into implementation standards like the trans exchange standard that the UK have implemented to collect the schedule data across the, the UK. So every transit agency or public transport agency in the UK is required to um, put register their schedules and their bus stops or just their schedules 
in the trans exchange uh, XML schema format. And they have guidance documents on how to do that. Um, but what it allows them to do is to come up with a single format. It's kind of like the schedule, like the, the Google spec, um, but it has a lot more information than the Google spec does because it's based on this enterprise uh, data model, trans model, and so it has that framework. So it connects back to, to um, business areas that aren't necessarily supported by TransExchange. So TransExchange needs additional information. It's not just schedule information. When you build a schedule, you also have something, you have public transport nodes, bus stops, or time points. You have administrative areas that you have to worry about. And some of those, those uh, information come from other agencies. And so they link together through and through other standards as well. They link together through these other kinds of um, uh, other standards, other implementation standards. And the Trans Exchange supports their Journey Web application, which uh, if you go to, I think it's called journeyweborg if you go there, you can get anywhere in uh, the UK. It's a trip planner. And you can um, identify any origin or location and get there through public transportation in uh, the UK. So uh, TCIP, um, that was initiated in 2001 by APTA. It's based on a um, previous version of TCIP that was part of the uh, National Transportation Communications for ITS Protocols uh, 1400 series. Um, the uh, standard was just released uh, in August, version 3.0. Um, it's used to enable efficient exchanges of messages, and it, its primary focus is ITS, but it also expands to uh, other areas. It's a messaging standard. It only has the interfaces. And the way that it's implemented is through a performance implementation specification where you have to constrain it. Uh, every implementation is going to be different um, so that every interface may be based on different um, semantic definitions. So you have to be very careful in how you use TCIP to ensure that it's mapped up in the back end. Because otherwise, if you're trying, if you send data through two different messages to two different applications, and then you want those two applications to talk to each other, you may not have, you may have created a conflict in the semantic definition of the data at that point. So you have to be very careful how you use a messaging standard unless that messaging standard is constrained by some kind of data model. So do you have a specific well, TCIP hasn't been implemented, so I, I don't. But theoretically, that's the case. And if you take a look at, at how TCIP and all the different options that TCIP has, you can see that it goes in two different applications. And then it wants to go to a, a third application from those two applications. If, for example, um, one of those applications uses latitude and longitude and the other one uses intersection, then you're not going to be able to match them up in the third application because you have a loss of information. Um, so the workflow of how the, those messages work is going to be a problem. And that would be an example. Uh, that may not be the best example, but that is an example of something that could happen. Now, the geospatial one-stop is a very interesting standard effort that um, took place because it, its main focus was really on geographic data. Um, it, it was initiated because you have all these OGC web services that Scott talked about earlier, but you don't have the richness of the kinds of, of data that the federal government supports. So you might have little pockets of communities, and, and 
uh, transportation data was, was missing from that. And part of the reason is because there was an absence of feature set data and a, and a robust definition of what that, those features are to those specific domains. And so they gathered all, all, any kind of layer they could think of that would go into um, uh, geospatial data that the federal government supported. And they brought groups together of, um, of experts from those fields who got together and developed a data model that related to spatial data so that that spatial data could be uh, overlaid on top of each other. And so it was a very careful process that they went through to make sure, first of all, that, that the layers themselves, the different domains, were well defined and then that the different layers can talk to each other and, and work together um, using the OGC location services. Um, it took over two years, two years. There were a number of people uh, here who participated in that. And um, the transit track, the 7D, is then part of this larger transportation network space and then even larger um, geographic space, geographic data space. Um, so you can see how it can work. It can take off the bat, it can take advantage of the, the OGC location services. It can be um, encoded in GML or it can be encoded in any other kinds of encoding uh, spec there might be. So for example, the part of the international ITS community uses this uh, geographic data format. Um, they don't use GML. And it can be encoded in that as well if there's a binding, uh, a match of the, of the feature information from, uh, from uh, uh, geospatial one stop to that encoding if it, if it wants to. So, um, so in terms of, of scope, um, trans model is a conceptual data model. Uh, geospatial one stop is also a conceptual data model. Uh, trans exchange and TCIP are both XML messaging. Um, geospatial one stop can work with GML. Um, primarily, it's focused on GML and other OGC web services. Um, in terms of scope of the business areas, trans model covers everything, <coughs> TCIP covers everything, trans exchange covers service and calendar, and geospatial one stop covers transit features, those things that that are attached to the earth, for example, and services, those things that the temporal information that is attached to the geographic uh, information. Um, in terms of the context, with spatial data, trans model is connected to GDF, uh, trans exchange is based on trans model, TCIP is consistent with other ITS standards like uh, incident management, advanced travel information system, and geospatial one-stop is part of that geospatial model that I was talking about before. So what are the benefits of the approaches? Um, well, when you have a conceptual data model, you describe what the data concepts are, you define the relationships and the constraints. Um, all the messages share the same underlying format, particularly if it's robustly defined. So that um, improves the semantic or may, maybe not ensures semantic interoperability, but certainly promotes semantic interoperability as the underlying basis. Um, when you have the implemented data models, um, that's the geospatial one stop. Um, one of the things that you want to do when you implement these, these uh, data models is you want it to fit in a context within a larger domain because transit doesn't exist as outside of everything else. It sits on the transportation network. It um, has to interact with uh, traffic management data and all those other kinds of things. And so that, that's an important consideration in defining um, a transit data model. Um, you need to preserve relationships and constraints and constrain alternate descriptions. I mean, that's 
very clear both in in the, the lessons learned from the early years of trans model where you had five different implementations and you couldn't really use it um, and as well as in TCIP or actually some of the other ITS standards that are so difficult to use that you can't even <laughs> recognize some of the, the instance XML schemas, you know, the derivative XML schemas because there are so many choices that you can select in defining the instance of, uh, of, your, of your message. Um, and you have to enable semantic uh, and data concept integrity checking because um, one thing, I mean, all programmers know garbage in, garbage out, and that's what happens if you don't have some kind of validity checking in your data. And that's one thing that in open source software, you need to know that the data is going to be valid. Um, I think uh, Mike Berman and Frank experienced, or, or Mike referred to that when he said that uh, we need to know if it's if it's the data publisher or, or if it's our data um, that's at fault here, um, and because it's easy to blame the that application when it's really the data that's the problem. I'm used to it though. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the one thing about messaging and dialogues, which is also important for open source software, is that you need to understand the orchestration of the data, you need to understand the uh, collaboration of the data, the, the dialogues that, uh, of, of interaction between different applications, because, or at least the patterns of those, because that's also really key in order to ensure that your applications work. Um, trans model, you can see one of the, the key things is how do you get from a conceptual data model to an implemented data model of some kind. Um, the orange boxes over here are two of these boxes up here and you can see we went from an entity relationship diagram to an XML or to a class diagram or an XML instance and that's how trans exchange uh, migrated from that data model to the implemented data model. Um, they also have this, uh, an, another XML schema I told you before, this is the administrative areas um, and this NAPTAN is for, is like a bus stop inventory with, which catalogs all the buses, bus stops across the uh, uh, England and, uh, and areas. TCIP is based on the ITS architecture um, and the interchanges between those, those boxes over here. I won't go too much on that. Um, you can see that TCIP, when you, have, when you have one application and you're going to uh, another application, you have all these choices of messages. So identifying what the choices are, constraining those choices, is key for uh, any kind of implementation. And then you need to constrain the messages themselves to, to meet. Now, if you have a single data repository over here, which is your data model, you need to make sure that all of these interfaces relate to the same underlying data model that's in that data repository. But most transit agencies don't have an enterprise system like you heard from about um, King County Metro and TriMet. The geospatial one stop, you can see this is the entire model. It's a very simple model, um, but it's very uh, uh, robust in how the, the elements relate to each other. Um, so it's a good starting point. Um, and then it defines what those feature sets are. And so what you can do in OGC, you can ask for a feature set and it knows how to reference that feature set and grab that feature set and send it off to wherever you need, whether it's a data file or whether it's, it's a map. Um, classification of these standards. Um, I'm kind of running out of time. Okay. Um, this, is, this is where um, you really where you can build a, um, a family of
of interfaces and standards that <coughs> rely on these abstract models. Um, so, for example, the con and this is an example of, of what the, um, the geospatial community has done and, and an example of their cla a classification scheme that, that they presented at a, a meeting um, or at a working group, where there are ISO standards that are the abstract representations, and you have um, web services that are based on these relationships and these definitions. There are ways of, of encoding those features, and there are templates for how um, all this information should be exchanged. Um, and so you have your abstract models, which is what you're talking about, almost what the requirements are for the data or for the interactions. And then the how, which are your implementation specs, for how you actually exchange the information or implement or store the information so that you can get at that information. Um, and so um, this is a, a good model for, I think, for us to understand um, because we can put some of our alternatives or we can create a, um, a classification scheme for the foundation of how we want to implement open source software into uh, <coughs> categories like this. Uh, we can have our abstract model. We can say, OK, well, this is how we're going to define the data. And this is how we're going to find, define the relationships of the data. This is how we're going to define the interaction of applications. This is how we're going to encode it. And this is how we're going to implement it. Uh, how we're going to create web services to implement it. So this is what we have right now. And you can see it's a, kind of a mishmash, that nobody has a single approach to doing this. And it's something that we might, as a community, to look at and come up with, with a set of standards or groups of standards um, that will work for open source software. Um, that is at a domain level as opposed to an IT level, you know, specific to transit as opposed to um, all of IT. Because there are, there are rep uh, represent representative hierarchies for web services, uh, but not for how transit uh, domain information is, uses those web services or the standards that create web services. So then the challenges we have are, is there a one common representation that meets all our downstream applications? You know, all our open source software projects or priorities. And there's always going to be exceptions. So how do we handle those exceptions? And I think those are really some of the, the key questions that we have. And I just want to go back to uh, why we need a transit reference model. And uh, we need to lower barriers for agencies. Um, we need application plug and play. Um, I, I think that that's a key one, especially for transit agencies that don't have um, either that the specific skill set that's needed to, to implement to develop their own software or to use or to, to uh, add to open source software, but they want to use open source software. We need to enable applications to work together. And in that sense, we need that underlying common framework. We need to improve the clarity of transit data concepts, because it's all over the place. And even within a, tr a single transit agency, you might have four definitions for what a pattern is. And we need to define a migration path for the industry to define and understand what its best practices are. We really don't have that today. So this would be at least a model for the industry for small and large agencies to migrate to uh, a model that uh, can support the kinds of information that they have. So that's this presentation.
you, Polly. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Gilligan. I am a software engineer at TriMet. Sit right next to Frank, who you saw if you were here in the last session. Um, and I did some data model comparisons. I took the TriMet data model as it exists, and I compared it to a few others um, that Polly talked about. And I'm just going to talk about my findings and doing so. Um, I can probably skip over most of these because I'm sure you've been bored to death with definitions like this, but just uh, she talked about data models, conceptual versus physical, whether or not it's been implemented or not. Um, and she talked about TCIP and geospatial one stop and how uh, they actually haven't been implemented yet. Um, and then the application is, of course, how you use the data. That's just practical use of it. And then the interface is how you would exchange data from one model to another. Um, I think this has already been <laughs> spoken about, but why we need a common data model. Uh, obvious reasons to reduce interface development and or programmer time. Um, you know, if we spend every, <coughs> if we didn't have a common data model, and you have a lot of applications, a new application comes in for this transit agency and every other transit agency then has to write an interface from their data to that application. So it's a lot of development time. Uh, more consistency, of course, uh, across the boards, and it simplifies implementation of open source software, such as the open schedule publisher that we saw earlier. Uh, just real quickly, um, this is kind of a, this is the TriMet data model. This is what our central database looks like, and then you can see all of the applications which are communicating back and forth to the centralized database, and then uh, that same data is being fed to different uh, applications out there, uh, the schedule publisher or the transit uh, Google Transit. So we're actually writing an interface to publish the Google Transit data. Whereas this is kind of the application-centric view, where as a new application comes in and that application has to talk to another, or and then every time that a new application comes in, you're constantly creating interfaces to each of those things to be able to keep the data in sync. And the obvious reason why a centralized database um, is, is a lot easier for uh, application developers to make sure that the, the data is up to date. Uh, in that same sense, the more transit agencies are uh, beginning to see the benefit of a centralized database. And in that same sense, if we had all had a common data model, sharing uh, data across agencies becomes easier, just like sharing data uh, between applications. It's the same sort of thing. If all of us had the same common data model for us to collaborate, it makes it much easier rather than having to pass the data back and forth and keep it in sync. Um, so here's kind of the example, uh, the Google Transit data feed. Uh, this is without anyone having a common data model. So how it exists today, each of the transit agencies that are participating in uh, the Google Transit feed, uh, these particular uh, agencies are right now. They're all taking their data, they've taken, the, the, they've uh, written the feed, the interface to the feed, and then Google's absorbing that data, uh, and then that's being published out to Google Transit. So if we all had a common data model, we could collaborate on uh, either creating one interface, or Google probably would have said, oh, you already have a data model? Well, that'll make it a lot easier. We'll just design our application around your data model, and all of us would just say, okay, here's our data. And it, there would have been no uh, time for each of us to have to create those interfaces. Uh, same thing, the timetable publisher application. Uh, it has, you know, it uses a uh, just kind of enhanced version of the Google feed spec. So this kind of shows how uh, how that works, and if we all had one data model, of course, it would just utilize that data model and the interfaces wouldn't have to be uh, developed. So, uh, let's see here. 
So this is kind of what my comparison looked like. I took how our data model is currently at TriMet, and then I looked at these three data models. I looked at the geospatial one-stop um, data model. I actually looked at King County Metro's data model as it exists, and then uh, looked at the Google data feed spec. And I just kind of took and saw, okay, now how would we get our data into this format, and where would that come from, and how easy would that be to translate that data across? So this is just a snapshot of how we feed the data to Google Transit. We have their, uh, their spec is to create a stops text file. It has a stop ID number. Okay, well, we have a table in Oracle that's called location, which has a location ID. It's the same thing. It's just the mapping of that. Uh, so this is my findings in doing that. The, um, the Google Transit feed, it was very easy for us to feed it because the Google Transit feed was kind of based on our data model. Um, so <laughs> that didn't take much time. Um, but the, the one thing that I want to point out from an application developer's point of view, um, that there's a huge driving force right now behind Google Transit. All these agencies want to get their data into Google Transit because, you know, we could, we, we could never develop a map-based web trip plan right you now. That's just, that's a great accomplishment uh, to be able to have that. So with them stepping in, there's a huge driving force for agencies to get their data into this format. So if we could somehow, as developers, grab a hold of that format and do something with it, such as the timetable publisher, it would make our lives a lot easier in developing open source uh, technologies. It's a very simple, easy format. It's not a comprehensive data model by any means, and it's not a data model really at all. It's just a feed that specifies, you know, you need this file with this format, and this is the data that you need to put in it. Um, so it was only built for one application. So uh, given that, it's not comprehensive like the other data models we've talked about. Uh, King County Metro, I don't have a lot to say about it because uh, <laughs> our data models are so similar that I was kind of focusing on where the similarities were and not where the minute differences uh, within the model are, but the fact that they were created completely independently, built on needs of software being developed and coming in and out, that they look very similar. Uh, and I just thought that was an interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the geospatial one stop, it differed from the other models that I looked at, such as Transit, uh, TriMet, uh, King County Metro, and then I looked at the Google feed spec, in that it was developed as a, an app, as a use, ah, how do I say this? Uh, the TriMet and the King County Metro data models were just kind of on, as changes needed to be made, that's how the data model was created. Uh, as new applications came in, new needs within transit. And this model was built as a encompassing to fit the needs of all transit agencies. Uh, the other thing that can kind of be kind of uh, confusing for developers like myself, the nesting of other standards within it. So the ISO standards that are utilized by TCIP, I just had to go do a Google search, and by about the fourth page that I clicked on, I finally found the answer I was looking for. <laughs> okay, what is this ISO standard? What are the attributes of it? And it was just a drill down paradigm, and it, it, it became kind of confusing. And then there was a large number of optional data elements within the standard also, um, within that model. Uh, so with that, when the more optional data elements that you have, I understand why they're optional. But the more data option, the, the more data elements you have optional in the model, the, the harder it is to rely on that data when you're developing an application against it. Um, the less standard it becomes. <laughs> yes. And uh, so the other thing is it took some logic on our end to go from the TriMet data model to that data model. For instance, we store a, a begin date and an end date for our stops. Uh, this just had a flag of whether it was active or inactive. So we basically say, okay, on this given day, uh, is this day between this begin date and end date? If so, it's active. If not, it's inactive. Just things such as that. 
Uh, so my conclusions, uh, as a developer, um, I, I think that it might be smart for transit to start really small, something with a practical perspective, grab those low hanging fruit, and uh, try to design something such as the timetable publisher. I'm by no means advocating, you know, uh, the large data model or using the Google Transit feed only, but it seems like there's almost a happy middle ground there. Um, if we could latch a hold of the Google Transit feed and we could do some simple applications, if we could work on something like that and expand upon it, uh, we could benefit from that possibly. Uh, I, I also have the idea that if you looked at existing data models from transit agencies who have all of these applications working against their centralized database, such as King County or TriMet, if you reviewed existing physical data models and just said, okay, you know, TriMet, we're just going to publish our physical data model, you tell us what's wrong with it and how it won't work for, for you, and maybe that could be an approach also. Um, just an idea. Uh, the final goal, of course, is it must support all applications. It must be useful uh, uh, for a wide for wide adoption across the industry. But if you possibly if you started out small and then grew the standard, it may be easier to implement, especially for smaller agencies with less uh, technical uh, staff on staff on hand. So that's it. Thank you. There's one more presentation. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, what was what what is missing out of the Google Transit um, feed? I think directionality is one of them. Yeah, but I mean, uh, like if you were to look at our all-encompassing transit model for schedule data, mm -hmm. it's fairly complete. But when you look at the other aspects of Prime Minister's data model, like uh, collecting accident incident information. It doesn't even um, begin to apply. Right, or amenities at particular stops, or things like that that, that it doesn't have. So it just have to be the font or another option. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm back again. Um, <laughs> now I, I uh, after espousing the philosophy that we need an underlying data model, I actually have to put that into practice. And so this is a case study of, of uh, what we're doing in the downstate region of New York City. Uh, New York um, includes the two largest transit agencies, New Jersey Transit, New York City Transit, the largest uh, commuter rail system, Long Island Railroad, and one of the other largest uh, commuter rail systems, Metro North Rail, as well as agencies, private carriers and public carriers uh, in Long Island, Westchester, Rockland. Anyways, there's over 50 carriers altogether, some with two rugs and some with hundreds of rugs. Um, and so, um, let me go back. Uh, so this is, project name is called the Transit Schedule Data Exchange Architecture, kind of a big name for something that's um, simple but very complex because of all the part players. Um, I'm going to talk about what motivated uh, New York State DOT to um, initiate this project, um, a little bit about the project, the scope of the project, our approach and issues, and the progress we're making to date. So, what is the, pro the, the problem? Well, many, a number of years ago, um, uh, New York State DOT received some federal money to develop a trip planner. And um, they spent the first few years trying to figure out how to get the data into the trip planner. And so the contractor at the time who's um, developed interfaces to all the major systems and developed a, a schedule data maintenance system. So if smaller agencies can get their their schedule, you can see the access database. It was uh, uh, it sat on the agency's uh, 
desktop, there was no mapping tools associated with it. Well, actually, NICE.Create created one for some of the requirements. <coughs> and then what you don't see in this picture and what you really never hear about is what happens at this interface. Because what happens there is you have to integrate the data. And because the data is at different conceptual layers, you have to begin to understand what a trip means to one organization versus another, what a pattern means, what a root segment means, what uh, locations may be defined in, in state plane or may be defined in, in uh, WGS 84, may be defined as intersections, may use community names that you've never heard of. So this process, what happens here, to get into here, is a nightmare. <laughs> it's three month effort, oh my God. It's, it's been reduced. Um, but you could ask any organization that integrates data um, of constituent organizations how long it takes them to prepare the data to get into their trip planner. And unless the data is clean coming in, it is a nightmare, absolute nightmare. If the data is clean and there are validity checks and the data doesn't change from, from one um, load to another, then you can reduce the amount of the, or you can create an automation system to actually pull the data in. But if you can't do that, because the data is from three or four different systems and it's not integrated to begin with from the, from the agency, then you're going to have a major problem. So that's what New York was facing. Um, so what, it, what does it mean? It means that staff time and resources are just totally numb with trying to clean up this data. Uh, increase of project costs and delays of schedule to deploy the system, and then you have a maintenance problem every single time you're loading new data. And um, you have customer issues to deal with because there are certain expectations. They're certainly coming from Portland and Seattle. You can see that once your uh, customers see this information, um, uh, well, they, they go to another city and say, how come these guys don't have this? I mean, my uncle goes to London all the time. He lives in Chicago. I apologize to Gary. <laughs> he, he, come, he, he reads in the newspaper that one of the, the transit systems there is implementing this $20 million automated vehicle location system. And he calls me up because he knows I deal with transit. He says, how come we can't get real-time information out of these guys? They're putting in all this. They could do it in London. We can, we can get real-time information in London. So the customer expectation really goes through the roof, um, especially when people travel and see that in certain places they can get certain kind of information. Um, and they expect it now from government agencies to provide information to them. Um, what standardizing the interfaces do is you can deploy these systems faster, you don't have to necessarily depend on a single vendor, um, and you can uh, de develop component parts, um, pieces of information, like web services are a good example. You can, you can deploy certain little applications, um, and that creates an economy of scale for for transit agencies. That's the benefit of standardizing your interfaces. And so one of the things that we wanted to do in New York was to um, acquire or bring those benefits into the region because the resources to maintain TRIPS 1, 2, 3 was just an inordinate amount of money and time by, um, spent by both transit agencies and the vendors. Um, and so they uh, initiated a project to, um, and the objectives were to have a seamless exchange of information from the transit agency to a central repository of their scheduled data. Um, there were application uh, requirements and for that data, it had to meet <coughs> certain downstream applications. And TRIPS 123 was one of the critical 
uh, downstream applications. Timetable generation was another critical application. Um, and then there were a whole um, slew of other applications that the agencies hadn't even thought of in terms of automating the coordination of their information, re uh, gathering report information at a policy level across the state and, and by uh, MPOs um, that this project was able to meet as well. Um, and to develop an infrastructure in order to support the transit agencies. They're very concerned about who has their data. They want to know who wants their data and they want to be able to, to regulate who has their data. And so there was um, uh, a need to establish a framework in order to support those kinds of, of requirements. Um, we also wanted to make sure that whatever was done could be, there was a technology transfer component to, a strong technology transfer component to the program. Um, there was a strategy to deploy this uh, reference model or the definition of the data to be exchanged. And we need to um, comply with the uh, FHWA rule and the FTA policy on ITS, uh, Rule 940, because the money was attached to that as well. Plus, it's good policy anyways. Um, it's a system and engineering approach that uh, needed to be included as, or, or drive the process of how we collected the, the requirements and the importance of the system. And so what the two major outcomes of this project is in XML schema. It's a specification uh, for uh, scheduled data and schedule and related data from these transit agencies. Um, that's called the SDP. And then a prototype or a demonstration of how it would work as a data repository. Um, and uh, the, the, a set of tools for bringing the data in and making sure that the data met the semantic, the data concept definite and requirements um, of the SDP, as well as um, um, being able to disseminate that data to, in different formats to, to uh, data consumers. Um, so there are a number of tools that needed to be defined um, as well, and there's an interest in, in um, once they're completed, to uh, publish them as open source. But there are licensing and legal issues that New York State DOT has to work on. Um, and then we'll actually demonstrate that this can work in the real world and how it can work in the real world. So what is the scheduled data profile? Well, it starts with defining the, the data. Um, yeah in a conceptual way, defining the relationships of the data in a conceptual uh, data model, defining business rules for how the data should be stored in the data model. And this is where you get into ensuring that you at least have an approach and you have consistency for people who use that data model. Um, and then from that conceptual data model, <coughs> define an XML schema with validation rules uh, inside of it or external to it. Um, and because the, the conceptual data model has um, primary keys and you can instantiate it as a logical model and you can define the foreign keys as well, in XML schema you can define primary keys or the equivalent of primary keys and foreign keys and so we've implemented that as well. So we have the, um, the integrity checking, the referential integrity built into the XML schema. And then implementation specs, how you actually implement it, how you integrate the data once it gets into the um, data repository, how you ensure that you have correct versions and versions that overlap so you can identify what is valid today or what's valid um, next season 
uh, or the next pick period. Um, so what we what we did is we looked at the scope of, of what the SDP had to support. We looked, we talked to transit staff and customers. We looked at the downstream systems. These are the, the kinds of systems that we looked at. Um, we we understood what the process needed to be where agency data came in it had to be integrated here and then it went out to some of the the uh, downstream applications um, here's trips one two three this existed this is for individual transit agencies who might want to use the sdp as their own format within their own organization as their own essentially like the Google spec, but a little bit more robust um, than the, the model over there, um, as well as uh, some of their, their other applications over there. Um, and then some regional applications uh, for fare collection, because there's a regional system for fare collection, and for ideally, they would, they would love to have something like this. Um, schedule timetables and and uh, what they call ride guides, which are at the bus stops, um, the schedule for that particular bus stop. So what did we decide to do? Well, we're going to have a portal architecture um, for the data repository. So we'll have search, discovery, brokering of access to the scheduled data resources. It meets the requirements that the transit agencies have levied on the system. Um, one thing, one way that we are trying to accommodate exceptions, uh, constraints, or extensions to the STP schema by the, the agencies, particularly since we have such a wide variety of different kinds of organizations who will be submitting data, is to have um, a, a very robust catalog and metadata definition with um, search capability. So um, if I want to know, does Metro North Rail data set support such and such feature, then I can query that. And I can know that they don't, but they have something else instead. And so we're allowing for that capability. And we expect that that metadata is going to be the key to ensuring that there is at least a, uh, a way to extend or to constrain data by the various agencies. We, we have to have this. And one of the reasons why is because we are talking about the difference of a bus stop. If we're just talking about facilities, we might have a bus stop that just has a stick, you know, a marker. Or we might have Grand Central Station or Penn Station that has six smaller facilities in it and 12 different operators um, that is, is just so complex that there's no way to define that just as a single bus stop. And there's no way to define, and when you're defining it as a facility, it's so complex it doesn't map to the bus stop. So we had to accommodate those kinds of of variations in scale, and we can do that through the metadata and the catalog that people can then look up. It's a little bit um, based on what the Geospatial One Stop uh, has, which is when, when we were meeting, um, we mentioned to the, the, uh, the uh, experts at the meeting that we have this issue of scale and they said well maybe what you need to do is when you create your feature sets you can also create a set of metadata that says okay I support these kinds of um, attributes but I don't support these kinds of attributes and so that idea was was borrowed and brought into this representation so here's uh, actually a bigger picture and you can see this is one of the applications, the data mapper, to take scheduled data from a particular agency and to put it into an SDP file in the portal itself. Uh, the data will be registered, cataloged, and the metadata included. The metadata um, will be electronically available 
um, and can be read electronically and interpreted electronically as well. Then we're going to have something called a message editor. So if you send me a WDSL, I can then go into any of these files and send you the response um, in, in the format of your WDSL. Um, then I can store these double WDSLs, and those are web service definition languages. That's how you want the data defined, uh, what the SOAP message is. Um, then you can, if somebody new comes along and says, what, how can I get the data? They can go into these WDSLs and they can say, okay, well, I want this WDSL in the Google API format or Google feed format and then that application can get that data into, in that format. So that's the concept. Um, so in terms of where we are at the project, we finished the phase two requirements definition. We have a conceptual data model. Um, we have XML schema. And we're into the design of the demonstration. Um, the functional requirements document we developed the preliminary uh, schedule data profile and the metadata XML schemas. Um, as we go along, we're finding things, so they're being tweaked here or there. Uh, we don't expect that they're going to be completed until the end of the project when we um, make determination. One of the things that we found in actually mapping the data directly, the real data, directly to the schema is that, and I'm sure Tim is going to laugh at me, um, we went from like uh, three meg, or 300 kilobytes of, of, for one route to close to a bag of, of that same route once we put it into the XML schema. So it tripled the size of, and, um, and Lots of developers I've talked to said comma delimited files are the way to go hmm. um, when you're dealing with large data sets. And so um, the other thing is to divide the schemas into multiple schemas uh, instead of a single schema to reduce the size. So we will need to uh, deal with that once we uh, actually come to the implementation and recommend the final schema. Um, Right now we're into the uh, demonstration. We're going to develop the data mapping and, uh, and message uh, editor tool, uh, do the portal demonstration design and coding, uh, deploy it, evaluate it, and then uh, recommend a plan for deploying it not only in the New York State, uh, the New York, the downstate New York region, but also all New York. Um, what did we learn? Lessons learned about uh, the conceptual data models, the different data models, um, that none of the approaches that were developed really capture all the needs of the region. None of those data models do. Um, trans model provides an overall abstract data model, um, but there are some significant limitations. And one of the, the key things we wanted to do was to make sure that we could use the OGC web services. And so really the, the geospatial one stop, but there were a lot of features in trans exchange and how they went from trans model to trans exchange to that implementation spec that we liked. Um, the idea of using key and key ref in the XML schema uh, was really helpful in, in uh, helping us ensure that we brought over the logical consistency <coughs> of the data uh, and, um, but it had problems with the spatial and timing data because it wasn't, we wouldn't be able to use OGC web services. Um, TCIP was application exchange. It might help us with figuring out patterns of exchange of data or messages between applications, but we really couldn't rely on it to uh, robustly define the data needs of the region. Um, geospatial one-stop, the core of geospatial one-stop was what we actually focused on because it had a very robust way of 
associating transit uh, space and time to a large, the larger transport network. We have, remember we scaled it down to just scheduled data. Um, we also included the, uh, the geospatial feature representation um, from GML and from OGC. Um, and uh, we defined the metadata. We integrated integrity checking and the requirements for integrity checking into the requirements, as well as maintaining the XML file, um, the schema itself, so that there's a way to version the schema and there are rules for how you add to the schema or take away from the schema as well. Um, conceptually, we divided the, uh, we partitioned transit space so that we um, made sure that the relationships between the transit space were there, but that we um, uh, separated the space so that it was modular. Um, we, uh, we have the, the schedules, the transit network, the places um, as uh, separate spaces. Um, this is part of the model. You can see it's, it's actually just a little bit more on the bottom, um, but it's not really that complex, certainly not as complex as, uh, as transmodel. Um, then we migrated to an XML schema organization, and we, uh, similar to the way that, that Transmodel put together, we have the, the, uh, the transit space as, as kind of the, the high-level nodes, and then the data tables um, as uh, individual um, nodes or tables, whatever. Um, and we try to make sure that we stayed, we didn't go beyond three levels, although in this case we had to go uh, to a fourth level of, uh, of a hierarchy. Um, best practices in developing XML schemas um, recommend no more than four. Um, so we tried to limit it to three. So can you talk about the IP pass about that? <laughs> um, so you can see this is a larger piece of the conceptual data model um, where we have um, a plant component which is associated with a, a transit facility and we can have multiple amenities, passenger access components which are like um, elevators, escalators, uh, walkways, stairs, portals, entrances, and e exits, and transit stops. And one of the things that we did was we ensured that if a transit agency was small enough and all they had was a single place at a transit stop, they could create their transit stop inventory. And they didn't have to. OK. They, I have to stop it. So, this, this is what the, uh, the schema looks like from that model. Um, we ensured the consistency by having identifiers and unique identifiers and then having um, essentially foreign keys associated with certain data over there, um, those data. Um, right now, this is the last slide. The data <laughs> map requirements are completed. Um, we're in the process of de developing the uh, wireframes um, for uh, the data mapper in the portal. Um, we still have the designs to develop. Um, we are uh, mapping uh, real data to the model to make sure that it works. We've done an analysis of the data to make sure, kind of like what uh, Mike did, one-to-one uh, -one analysis this data needs to be converted and transformed to that. The data mapper, we've identified all the requirements. We needed to do that to identify the requirements that we needed to put in the data mapper. Um, and um, we'll use the dynamic timetable generator in TRIPS 123 to validate that the SDP meets those downstream application needs. And we're also going to get the uh, schedule data uh, to and try to implement that as well.
because it's a Java platform that we're using, and we're using Tomcat. So, <laughs> little tests is a way that we can more on it. Exactly. Um, oh, it wasn't the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Um, come visit us. <laughs> it's not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs>